Okay. So before we start, I will also have a look at the wiki. So I have posted, um, last week I posted a video about error handling. Uh, this is good good video to check. Uh, Go is very simple. In error handling, you have a type error and then you can uh, propagate uh, errors in similar fashion as in Java. Doesn't, Go doesn't really have exceptions and error handling basically relies on you returning error uh, from methods that could potentially return error and then checking with if statement if there was an error. It's a little bit tedious, so some people don't like it and there have been numerous proposals of how to make it more robust. But as it is now in Go 1.5.7, uh, no big changes have been introduced. We, we have, uh, a couple of years ago, they didn't have the chaining of errors. Now there, there is this kind of a wrapping, which makes it a little bit easier, but it's super simple. So it's, I think, half an hour video. So uh, make sure you did watch it. Um, and I posted some videos for today's lecture about concurrency. So those two uh, very good lectures about the fundamentals of concurrency, but also a number of patterns and number of more advanced topics. So I will, <clears throat> our lecture is sort of introduction to those two lectures. Uh, that one is I think half an hour and that one is maybe 35 minutes. So they are also worth watching, although they are quite fast. Uh, yeah, I mean, I watch them in 1.5 speed, so <laughs> but th there is a lot of content. Um, so you may need to take your time and analyze the code snippets and analyze the examples a little bit longer. So th those are really good compliments for our, um, our lecture today. And then there are two packages. So if I show you, yeah, let's go to this one. I need to make it a little bit smaller because I have the Zoom thingy hiding me part of my uh, window. So um, this is a simple project. As you see, everything is in a single folder. Uh, and then there is a main and the kind of an entry point called leak test and the whole package is called leak test. Uh, this is an example of a package, which is not a module because you don't see go mod in here. Uh, it's a kind of an old fashioned uh, package, which was distributed. Um, and it's used for um, checking leaks and coroutines and go routines. So I will, um, I, I'm leaving it here, not for you to really use it, uh, but for kind of checking out how the package structure looks like and how people used to do uh, packages distributed for others to use without go modules. And then there is another one, which is uh, go PS, which stands for go processes. Uh, that, that one is already module. You see there is a go mod. It's a modern uh, way of um, providing, you know, library to, to other people. You have a number of uh, packages and some sub packages inside your structure. Um, and then you have the main entry point in the top level. So this is what I also described in this video uh, where I went over how you should organize your projects and how you need to deal with packages. So you can use those two, um, you can use those two projects as an example of how to structure your projects and also how to do packages inside a Go project. They are useful for testing Go routines, but you don't really need to use them. They are quite heavy. Like if you have really complex concurrent program, maybe you will make use of it. I, I didn't, I usually do this. So at the, at the end of, Today lecture, I will show you how to do this and what this is for. And this is one line that you put inside your main. And by putting that extra line in your main, you can sort of debug if you closing everything and if you don't have any go routine uh, leaks in your program. So those two are mostly for demonstration of how to organize your packages. But if you into concurrent programming and if, if you want to uh, profile or um, check leaks in your programs more, those two might come handy. For most people, uh, just this one line is enough. 
So this is the, the material that has been posted already. And the plan for this week is to spend some time today on concurrency and um, testing, and then spend some time tomorrow on JSON parsing and simple web applications. And then we continue a little bit on that on Thursday for the um, BPROC people. So there will be a little bit more in depth uh, discussion on, on Thursday, but for the, the normal uh, sessions is, yeah, actually I, I kind of uh, twisted, right? So um, I don't remember who is in which day. We have a uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the two are um, compulsory for everybody and one is optional. So on the, on the optional one, we will make a little bit uh, more in depth analysis of some of the um topics that we covered this week all right so <clears throat> if you have yes so there are some questions let me just check um yeah so how how the question is how to make uh, your own modules um so the uh the <clears throat> How you make modules is also described into organizing your uh, project packages. So the, the difference between making a single package and making a module with a single package is that if you create your, so if you go and you're in top level folder and you want to start your project. So when you want to start your project, you create a folder uh, with the, typically with the name of that, of that module or of that project. So if I, let's say I want to have a project called project one, so I will make a folder called project one, and then you, uh, you go inside. So you say uh, CD. So I make the folder called project one, I go to that project one. And now, normally, if you don't have a module, which you should always have a module, uh, these days, um, I cannot stress it enough, like you might watch some other tutorials and some other uh, older ways of programming and go without modules. We don't do that anymore. Always use modules. Uh, it makes your life much easier in relation to dependencies. So because we want to have a module, we just say go mod in it. And then we make a name of what that module is. You know, uh, by convention, we call the module the same as our project uh, and the same as the main package of our project. So in this case, it will be project one. And that's all you need to do to make a module. So you uh, call this and this command will, I mean, it's, there is no magic. Uh, what it does, it generates a file called go mod and go mod has, you know, a dependency on what go version you are relying on, which takes the current one. And it says in a top line module and your name that, that you just gave here. So you can, you don't need to call go mod in it. You can effectively just um, type the, those two lines yourself. The, there is an extra step that go mod in it does if you had a code base here. So if you do have a code base here of some go modules and some import statements, uh, what go mod in it do, it checks all your dependencies and lists all your dependencies, external dependencies in the uh, lower section of that file. So the dependency tracking and the dependency analysis is kind of done automatically and Go will fetch from uh, Git repositories all the external dependencies that you make in your, uh, in your project. And that's, that's the useful part of, of using the modules. So I will go back, I will remove project one. We are not gonna use this. All right, so any uh, other questions related to project organization or modules or packages. If you do have questions after watching this video uh, or playing with your own projects, then uh, post it on the on the issue tracker. Uh, you don't need to spend too much time on it. Like the, the concept of packages and modules, it's, uh, it's a little bit confusing, but it's not that important. Most people just have a single folder with a single package and that should be fine. Uh, if your project gets a bit more complex, you need to organize it a little bit more logically. But, you know, if you have everything in a single package, that's not a big deal neither. You can refactor it and you can reorganize it later in the course. So you can start just following the very simple 
uh, package structure and, and then refactor it after. Always start with something that works and then iteratively make it better. Don't try to make a very complex organization of your structure, even if you don't have all the files yet. Like uh, it's better to start simple and then make it more complex as you need it uh, instead of over-engineering it. Okay, so I, I will move on. Um, so we will skip the questions. Uh, yeah, so we, we had that question. All right, so just a quick check. Who, who watched the error handling video and who, who didn't? <laughs> So I'm just kind of a sanity check on how the communication in the course works. And it's rather obvious that it is not working super well. Um, I didn't make an announcement. I just posted the, uh, the error handling link on the, on the Discord. And I mentioned it on the last lecture in the course last week. So it was mentioned in the, in the lecture and it was posted on the, um, on the Discord, but apparently that is not enough. I ne we need to make it a little bit more obvious that things are posted and ready for being used. So that's a good feedback for me. All right, a uh, couple of quick tests, uh, how you're progressing with the, with the course material. So, All right, we have 30 people. I will wait a little bit more for people to join. We have 45 people in the class. So a little bit more, please join, please participate. It kind of helps with your learning. Great. All right, so let's, uh, we have a couple of sim relatively simple questions, I would say, uh, which check what we already covered in the course and some things that we haven't covered yet, uh, but you might know. So let's check. Oops, uh, I didn't start the quiz, so wrong button. All right. Lambda functions are simply written as func without a name in Golang. Is it true, false? Go does not have lambdas, I don't know. Great, that's a very nice distribution that I am happy to see. So most of you know uh, that it's just funk without a name. Uh, some people thought that's not the case and there are some obvious mistakes. So yes, of course, um, if we, if I go to Vim and if we look at some of the example code that we have here, I will go to main. All right, so if I have, so if I have a function, function f that takes a, uh, let's say process. So I have a, a function f which is called process and it takes a slice of ints. So let's say data and it is a slice of integers and it takes a function f which is a function which takes a slice <clears throat> of integers and the, and to make it pure, let's return a, a slice of integers. Um, then, okay, and it does something. So in here, I would have a logic which would say, for all this data, I will apply function f and do something with this. Um, so it, it will take effectively this data and produce a process data, right? So a process function takes some data in a form of a slice of integers, applies a function f 
to that data and gets um, um, gets a, a new slice. So the, the process function should return the new slice, right? So let's return it. So this one will return the new slice. And now in my main, I have some data. So I introduced some data and then I, um, I need to call process on this data. So I will say process on data. And now I need to have a Lambda function. I want to say, what should I do uh, with, the, with the data? And to introduce a Lambda function, I, I just say func and then there is no name. And I say, okay, I have some element. Uh, I, I have some uh, data called D, which is a data of ints, and it returns uh, a slice of ints, and then it does something. And then that would be a go way of introducing a, a lambda function inside inside this parameter. So instead of passing a function here, some named function, I have an anonymous lambda function which just defined on the spot. Uh, another useful place where you often define function on the spot is you just uh, um, declare a variable. I, I can declare a variable f and I say f is actually a function which takes integer and returns an integer. We, we, we had that in the lecture before. Uh, and then this is also a, a lambda function. So I have an assignment to f of some lambda function and the only difference between named function is that there is no name after func. So it's quite a nice consistent notation uh, for Lambda functions. All right, so next one. Next one, question two, All right. Go has type inheritance like C++. So can we write a base type and then inherit from it, such as to compose or create a, a more complex type? No, that's also a, um, well, whoops, I didn't mark the correct answer. Uh, a bug in the quiz. So the answer is no, um, Go doesn't have type inheritance like C++. Uh, we do have something similar to um, polymorphism with type inheritance, not, not really, but something that can simulate that using interfaces. Uh, the answer is yes, and I don't know. Yeah, so I don't know, obviously we need to work on that. And yes is a wrong answer. Um, so I, I suspect that some people might have been guessing. So Go does not have type inheritance. Go is focused on composition. So instead of creating complex things by inheriting properties and methods from the simpler things, what we do, we inject the simpler things inside a complex things and use composition instead of inheritance. That is a, a very big point because that's what most modern languages actually do. They substitute inheritance with composition. And even in C++ and even in uh, object, like heavily object-oriented programming languages that in the historically heavily relied on inheritance, we don't do that anymore because those large inheritance chains turned out to be quite difficult to maintain, quite difficult to design and they, they don't work that well. So there is a, a general push towards decomposing your problems, not into type hierarchies, but instead into kind of a composition. Uh, the idea is that you will have simple things and then you compose more complex things out of the simple things. So you use, um, you use a field. To, yeah, so um, in, in Go, it basically boils down to, uh, so let me delete that. It, in Go, it boils down to uh, defining simple things first. Uh, so let's say I have a type, which is a person, and a person is a struct, and I have, you know, the person, what the person can have. The person can have a name, uh, which is a string, and we can use capital letter if we want to export it, and then uh, it has an H, which is an int, and then I have a student. 
right? So um, I have a student and I have, um, and I have a teacher. So in normal uh, object-oriented languages like Java or C++, what would you say? You would say student inherits from a person. So student is a person. And then the student would have name and age as well, uh, but also you will add something in it. Um, and then for a teacher, you will do the same. In Go, you don't do that. So instead what you do is you use composition. So you say student is a struct, which is a person. So I could call it P for short, but it also has a student ID, right? So student is a person and it has a student ID, which is let's say string. And then teacher is also a person. So I would say teacher is also a person and it has um, staff ID, okay? So what now if I want to have a student who is also a teacher? We have like sometimes we have teachers like myself, I'm taking Norwegian course and I'm a student. So in Blackboard, I have to be represented as both. So it depends, like if you want to use two structs, uh, you can represent it like this. Uh, you could represent it as a pointer to a person Right, so instead of of actually composing a teacher uh, with the person um, embedded in the struct, I can say there is a reference such that I can have two instances, student and teacher, pointing to the same person. Um, so, like me, you know, Marius, and let's say I have some national national ID. Then I can have a single instance of a person which is both student and a teacher and it kind of re is represented by the reference. It depends how you want to you know, design your domain. The point is that you don't have inheritance and you have to use composition of some sort. Uh, so you kind of are composing com more complex things out of the simpler things. Uh, and you can follow similar designs as you're doing with object orientation, but without the inheritance and some of the uh, side effects that that carries. All right, so that's the main point, focus on composition. Um, and then you do have ability to do polymorphism uh, through the interfaces. We did discuss it before with the shapes. I will not uh, digress too much into that, uh, but remember that you do have polymorphism, this ability to do dynamic dispatch using interfaces. And then methods are built on structs. So I don't have um, methods built on classes or being kind of en enclosed in classes. I have methods being defined on, on my struct types and then I can um, play with my type, type system using that mechanism. So no in inheritance, structs, methods on structs. Uh, there is, we, we did discuss it. So um, if, if I have a person like this, and I define a method um, so I, I can have, okay, let, let me delete the student and teacher. Uh, let's, let's say we have a, a person and then I define a, a, a method. So I, I will define a method called H, um, which H is as a person. So, you know, the person becomes one, one year older. And I can do it in two ways. I can do it as saying, I have a person P, uh, which takes a, um, a reference to a person. And then the H doesn't take any parameters because what H does, it says the person H, um, you know, is, is bigger by one. So that's one way of saying, I have a, some functionality which operates on those structs. And what it does, it you know increases the age of a person by one. Uh, I could have it written in a more functional uh, style, so I can have a function which takes p as a uh, as a person and does exactly the same, right? So I can um, so p h the implementation is exactly the same. Um, and then in the first case, in this case, I will I would normally have some sort of a reference to a person. Uh, and then I would say called H and do this. 
And then if I have a reference to a person here, I would call it like this, right? So there is a little bit of a syntax difference. The behavior is exactly the same and the, the style is slightly different. So this style is more similar to your um, Java or C++ code like this line, uh, because you call methods on top of objects on, on top of your structs or, or containers for your attributes. Uh, this one is more functional. So you have a function which operates on some data and then the data can be kind of passed uh, through that. Um, so depending what you want to achieve and depending, uh, for example, if you are using some functional patterns and you want to have higher order functions which operate on functions, then this is a more preferred mechanism because then you can pass the age function somewhere. Uh, this age function is sort of attached to the to this struct and uh, it's it's not you know easily passable. It's not a first class object. There's a kind of a functionality which you can call on this, but uh, it's it's not as easy to extract it and pass around as a first type you know uh, function. So this sometimes you prefer that. But yeah, people who come from C or Java, uh, C or Java tend to like that notation and tend to like this and. That's you know that's idiomatic way of dealing with object-oriented programming and, and, and Go. So methods builds on structs. All right. So next question. That's in relation to today's lecture. Concurrency is the same as parallelism. I know the BPROC people already had that question before. So they will probably kill it here, but it is important for everyone. So I need to run through that again. Great, of course it's not. So concurrency versus parallelism. Concurrency is possible on a single CPU. Parallelism is not possible in a single CPU. So here is, is you know, just one difference that dis differentiates the, the two concepts. Um, so parallelism requires hardware support to, to happen, to, to be real. Concurrency doesn't. You can make concurrent programming on a single core, single CPU machine, and it will still be concurrent. And the relation is that if you do have a concurrent program, then it's much easier to make it parallel because it's already concurrent, which means they are already you've already isolated some of the functionality which can be, in theory at least, executed in parallel. Uh, they are not exactly the same. So some people, especially when you listen to those lectures, which I pointed out, um, so the lecture. Um, uh, by, by Pike, he makes it that if you prepare the concurrent program, it's, it's sort of much easier to, to make it parallel. Uh, yes, but no necessarily. So there are certain parallelization mechanisms based on vector registers and uh, single instruction multiple data operations, which concurrency is sort of not really helping you with. You have to do it by hand anyway. So there, there are certain areas where, yes, the concurrency makes parallel implementation simpler and, and possible, but not everywhere. Uh, parallelism is, is, is a different um, beast. You, you do deal with different concepts and different mechanisms to achieve it. So there is a relationship, and that's why I said it can aid parallel execution, but it, not necessarily. Uh, they, they are not as related as uh, some, uh, sometimes people claim. So the, the, yeah, th those are two categories. You, you, if you want to have a parallel program, you have to use those parallel um, utilities and parallel constructs. And for concurrency, use the concurrency constructs, right? All right, so then something about today's lecture uh, to see if you already know about concurrency. I mean, we did talk about it in the first lecture about Go. So concurrency in Go is part of the language, part of the standard library. I don't know. That should be easy. It, 
it is part of the language. Um, the interesting thing about concurrency is that most languages, mo most programming languages are single flow based and then concurrency is added on to this kind of a single flow based language in a form of library or standard library or threading or some kind of extra mechanisms. For example, um, in C++, we, in the C++ 20 and, and even in uh, 17, we do, the, the language gets some of the features for concurrent programming in the language. But historically that was completely decoupled. And that's true for most languages like in C, for example. In C, you don't have, or will probably never have really any um, constructs. Well, that's not true actually. In the, uh, in the latest C standard, they, they did introduce atomics. So they do also push some of the uh, constructs into the language. Okay, so yeah, never mind. But at the time Go came up uh, in 2009, that was not a typical mainstream thing. There were programming languages which did have concurrency building into the language, uh, but not uh, any of the mainstream languages. They, it, it's sort of always a bit of a add-on. So let's look, let's look at the leaderboard first. Ah, looks good. So Bob the Destroyer kick ass today. Uh, congratulations. Everyone else who is not on that list, yeah, you need to, uh, you know, uh, take, take the game to the next level a little bit. All right, so no stress. Uh, simple, sim simple question, why do we use concurrent programming? What do you think we need concurrent programming for? Uh, so as I said, most languages, most mainstream languages didn't have it in the language. So um, and why Go decided to have it in the language in 2009 for one of the mainstream programming languages. So what do you think? Um, what do you think? Why do we need? Um, good, so those are the answers that I thought you will say. Yeah, so th th there are some category of answers. So efficiency, optimization, performance, to speed up the program, performance. Yeah, th those are good. Um, this is one category, right? Um, and that's, that is on my list, but it's the last thing. And that's the thing that you should not really think about. There is something about um, uh, small programs making, oh yeah, smaller systems, um, or to be able to run smaller components at the same time. That's, yeah, that's something to, to do with it. All right, so let's, let's have a look what I have on my list. Um, as I said, I do have performance as a last point. So the, the first most important point that I had on my list that outside world is concurrent. So if you look around you and if you look at all your problems that you have to deal with, they are all concurrent. So what is programming? Programming is solving problems and modeling something from the outside world such that the computer can help us solve it, right? So if everything outside is concurrent and our languages our you know things that we can express are not th then we have a mismatch right so because everything outside is concurrent that you know it's natural to think in the in those terms we don't think about the world being a single threaded thing that is executed on a you know single core we think about the world as something that is you know at, at least concurrent i mean we do feel it's parallel uh, but we don't know on what hardware it, it's run. Maybe it's run on a single core, so maybe it's just concurrent, uh, but it's definitely concurrent, right? Uh, things do happen at the same time. Um, and what does it mean? It means that you have to deal with user, right? User is typing something while you're doing some processing, right? So those are already two things, like dealing with user input, with the you know interaction of the user requires you to 
to, to, to wait or to lock while you might doing something else, while you might fetching something from a disk or, or doing some processing. So for user interactions, you don't want to block. I mean, we do, we did have in the dark ages computers that did nothing and waited for you to press enter, right? It said press enter and the computer was like doing completely nothing. I mean, those times are gone. Like if the computer asks you, please press enter to continue, you can be sure the computer is doing a lot of stuff while waiting for you to make up your mind if, if you wanna press it or not. Um, so user interactions is a, a big one. Uh, IO, of course. So every time you need to make a network request or if you need to fetch something from the database, what do you do? You have to show up a user uh, progress bar or some spinning wheel, right? So while you're doing something for the user and user needs to wait, you have to show them something. So you need concurrency, you need a progress bar and fetching something from a database, right? Um, so those are the, um, the typical use cases where, you know, um, you do need concurrency. And as I said, every time you think about something happening and you think there is certain agency to it, you do need concurrency. So it is kind of everywhere. Like every single problem you think of, you, you think about things happening and you think about them happening independently of each other. So yeah, I'm dealing with user input, I'm dealing with physics, I have to refresh the screen, I have to fetch data, I have to check something from a REST service. You know, I have clients connecting to me. All those things are happening at the same time. So you do need concurrency to deal with it on the modeling side and on the execution side. And then, yes, I do have performance, um, but most of the time we don't care. Uh, most of the time we use concurrency because it's easier to program and because it's easier to think about what needs to be done rather than for performance benefits. Um, we use performance benefits in parallel uh, programming because we can achieve more at the same time. Um, concurrency is not necessarily the you know, performance benefit. I actually spent a couple of hours last night uh, preparing a demo uh, where I have a large array and then I am summing it up all together in, in a single processor, single threaded way. Or to be clever, I split the array into four chunk. I have, the array is huge, let's say uh, 10 million. And then I'm adding the chunks independently on four cores uh, and then summing the results. And it turns out it's slower. It's slower than the single threaded one because you know the compiler optimizations are kind of adding numbers so fast that me splitting it, doing it on four cores and combining the results adds extra overheads such that my concurrent implementation is actually slower than just a single threaded one. So why bother, right? So what I suggest is every time you think about concurrency, you, you'd never think about performance uh, because most of the time it actually doesn't matter. Uh, you think of the other reasons why concurrency makes your program more natural or easier to deal with. Um, and you only think about concurrency when you're dealing with parallel programming constructs like uh, single instruction multiple data or some SSE registers or something to do with GPUs. Then yes, then usually we deal with performance, we measure performance and we optimize the code to perform faster. Uh, but in concurrency terms, not really. Um, all right, so another open question. Uh, let's say I convinced you that you know concurrency is useful. Now you have to program something concurrently. You need to deal with physics engine and with user input and rendering to a screen. So what would you use? What sort of... Um, concepts or constructs you typically use when you deal with concurrency, when you need to do things at the same time. You can, yes, if you, yeah. Um, if you're coming from Java or if you're coming from C++, the answer is kind of obvious. So threads um, and then to coordinate, yes, you need to use atomic operations. Those are great answers. So what else? What else can you use for concurrent programming? 
then my plan was that you give those answers. Um, exactly. So uh, multi-threading, threads, mutexes, and atomic operations are kind of the typical things that people use for achieving concurrency. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, and if I unfold the, um, the points, you will notice that there is no threads. So concurrency in Go is not relying on the concept or abstraction, which is called threads. Um, Go routines are similar to threads, but they are not threads. Uh, and then uh, we do have mutexes and atomic primitives uh, in the language, but the main uh, primitive is called channel. Um, and that's uh, something that is unique to, to Go. And I mean, Go didn't invent everything. It, it reused certain things from other languages like uh, uh, CSP and uh, Newsquick. So the, the concept of channel is not like a novelty that Go bring on, but it's a novelty that Go bring on to them one of the mainstream languages. Uh, that concept has not been um, done before. Um, so I have, um, yeah, let me, yeah, let me go through those um, one by one. So Go routines is a concept similar to threads, but in, in multi-threaded programming, every time we start a thread, we have to allocate a certain amount of resources and we have a certain isolation between the threads. Whereas with Go routines, you can share uh, certain contexts. I, I mean, with threads, you can also share certain contexts, but you in, in Go routines, there is a mismatch. Yeah, let me, let me write this. It, it's easier if I draw some pictures than if I just wave my hands. So let's make some space and let's draw some boundaries. So here we have an operating system. An operating system is an abstraction layer on top of the hardware, right? So if I have a hardware and I have one CPU, then operating system is an abstraction layer which makes this one CPU shared across multiple applications and multi multiple programs uh, at the same time, right? Uh, otherwise, you know, only a single program could use the single CPU uh, if you don't have this abstraction layer. Th there are some, um, in the early days when we had computers and games, we were having like a cartridge or like a disc and you load a game on top of the hardware and then there is nothing else. It's only the game and the hardware. And then you play the game and the game had access to the CPU and disc and everything like um, without sharing it with anybody. Um, and then that was great, but every time you wanted to play a new game, you had to like take the cartridge out, reboot the whole thing and load the, the new game, right? Um, and then the concept of operating system came about because it's useful to share the resources. So we have this sort of abstraction layer here. Uh, and then we have uh, another abstraction layer, which is kind of, um, so we have our runtime system. Um, from the, the language that you're building your abstraction with. And here we have the kind of the, the language constructs, right? So on the, in here, yeah. So let's say in C, um, I have a, a, a concept of a thread and then a thread is mapped directly into the OS thread. Uh, and when I'm creating a thread, I will create an OS thread and then I will use o uh, operating system facilities to make the concurrency in my kind of language constructs. And that's way of dealing with that. Uh, Go routines is something slightly different because it takes this, pushes, pushes it to the runtime system and here gives you this kind of a go routine. Some languages call it coroutine. Um, 
the, the coroutine is a more generic uh, term. Go routine is like, you know, a play of words on coroutine for go, right? Uh, so they coined this term <laughs> specifically for go, but typically we, we call them coroutines. And the idea is that um, in the original C case, if I had 10 threads, um, I would need 10 OS threads to represent this. Uh, and that the, the OS threads are quite expensive. They are quite um, um, expensive to initiate and expensive to tear down. And they require quite a lot of resources for, for management. So they, they are quite um, time consuming consuming to start, to stop, and to manage, right? Uh, and then the operating system maps those to the, to the actual CPUs. So I can um, have a single CPU system uh, where I have multiple threads. I can have um, an eight core, eight cores uh, system. And then if I have a pool of eight threads, operating system can say, can be clever and can say, oh, great. I have eight threads to run. I will run them on eight cores. So, you know, you're quite efficient, right? So you have this sort of abstraction happening here. Um, so with C, I have from the language, I'm kind of talking directly on the OS level and I have a certain limitation of how many threads can I deal with. So if you are in C++ or in Java, and if you try to start thousand threads and simulate kind of a thousand ants doing something, you'll realize that the overheads related to starting thousand threads are so big that your program, you know, starts crawling. Um, so in Java, originally you had two concepts. You had green threads and the native threads. The native threads were going from the language construct directly to the OS. Um, and the green threads were going through the intermediary layer, which was doing that kind of a trans translation. So it's sort of similar here. You have sort of like a thread, but it's not one-to-one -to, -one to the OS thread. There is a, some sort of a thread pool, right? So on the OS level, we have a kind of a pooling and we have a clever way of managing multiple go routines on a certain pool of threads, which again is run on a certain pool of OS threads. Uh, and in Go, you control, you can control that. You can say how many OS threads I want to dedicate to my process, and then how many Go routines is independent of how many threads you have. So for the ex example, which I was telling you about, um, you know, adding the, the big array, I can run my concurrent code on a single CPU and I can tell Go, yeah, I mean, I'm creating, you know, four Go routines, but run it on a single core anyway or I can tell it run on four cores, uh, four threads, right? How many OS, OS threads uh, processes I'm, I'm, I'm gonna run it on. I cannot control that mapping directly, although there are some mechanisms that you can try to enforce certain um, um, mapping between your Go routine, the thread in the thread pool with the OS thread and with the uh, actual CPU. But that, that gets kind of a little bit difficult. So for most of the tasks in this semester, you don't have to do that. The idea here is that you can start as many Go routines as you please because it's super efficient. Uh, you don't have a limit. So if you want to start a million Go routines and do something with them, you can do that and it will run, you know, blazingly fast. If you try to start, you know, thousand threads on C++ or in C, um, yeah, you will notice that it's not gonna work. Uh, in Java, there is a little bit in between. So Java is not as bad as C++ in terms of the limits on how much you can spawn, uh, but it's not as flexible as Kotlin or as um, Golang. So Java is kind of in the middle, but you do have a concept of threat pools as well, which you can kind of um, manage. And you have a concept of tasks and then it's sort of like Go routines. So you can have concurrency done in Java in, in that way. But uh, I'm kind of ranting about Java too much. It's not about Java, it's about Go. So in Go, you have Go routines. It's super simple. Uh, it's super cheap. 
and you're not limited to, uh, you're not restricted by the OS restrictions of how many concurrent processes can we have, you can go wild. You can, you know, spawn thousands and thousands of Go routines and they will run extremely efficiently um, in your program. So to, um, to, to give you a little bit of a flavor, uh, I decided that I will not uh, go with the, uh, with kind of um, typing and uh, live coding. What we will go, we'll go to tour, go lang, and I will just show you some uh, more interesting aspects of programming with, uh, with threads, uh, with go routines, um, such that we understand it a little bit better. So uh, here we have um, the, the, a, a very simple uh, example uh, where we have a function called say, and to run it concurrently, to, to make it into a go routine, all you have to do is you, you say go in front. Um, so this will, whoops, sorry. Th this will execute the function um, first, and then this will execute the function in a normal way, right? So the, um, yeah, so let's run it. So what, what it does, it prints hello world um, five times and makes a, diff, um, the, the, a wait of 100 milliseconds between the prints um, and then quits. Uh, and then we have the six uh, print from, now we actually have do, doing it twice. So we will have 10 uh, printouts, right? Uh, five from here and five from here. The moment this, um, this function finishes and the program execution hits that point, all uh, go routines are killed, right? So if I, the, uh, if I don't do this, so I'm not printing say hello in the main, I'm only printing say hello five times in the go routine. What's gonna happen is uh, we're not gonna see anything because by the time this go routine started, executing and printing the stuff. And you see it before the first printout, it, it waits 100 milliseconds. The execution of main hit the closing bracket and quit. And that's the behavior, that's the design behavior of Golang such that it doesn't care about your Go routines. Uh, it just quits the execution. So, you know, uh, we just quit and we didn't see any output whatsoever uh, because this Go routine didn't start it yet by the time the program finished. In C or in C++, if you do the same, if you, instead of go, you use a thread and you run this function in a thread and you hit the closing bracket and that thread didn't finish yet, what's gonna happen? Um, I suspect that you're gonna hang until the, uh, the child process finishes. I'm not sure, I, I haven't tested it. So in, in the latest uh, versions of the language, so I, you know, you may need to uh, check me on that one, but I suspect that's not the behavior in C or C++. You're either gonna have an error or you're gonna have um, a wait for the children uh, threads to finish before the parent thread is killed. In Golang, that's not the case. So as you see, uh, that already demonstrates that I'm hitting the closing bracket of main and quitting the program while I have my thread running. Uh, it's not really a thread, it's a go routine, uh, but that already creates a leak, right? So this is exactly what I started with. And this is exactly why this line is useful because this line, if you put this line at the end, so let me do that. Um, so uh, put it as the last. Um, last instruction of main, okay? So if you put it as a last instruction of main and for it to work, I have to import OS and I have to import runtime. Uh, then you will see, so let, let's see with the normal execution of the program. So what, what happens here is um, I am running the go routine for the first time and it prints the print lines 
uh, waiting 100 milliseconds before the print lines. So yeah, let's, I mean, we don't care um, about the wait, to be honest. Um, and then it does the same, but in this thread. So this thread is gonna take approximately the same amount of time as this one, and they should finish. But I may have a race. So I may have that this one didn't, ah, sorry that this one didn't finish yet while this one finished and we killed the program or this one finished before this one finished and then I hit the program, right? So if I run the program, uh, yes, so I need runtime slash p prof. So let, let's rerun it. Okay, so Yeah, it's quite a long output. What we care about is how many total go routines I have when I'm hitting the closing bracket. <laughs> the moment I'm hitting the closing bracket, and if I have two go routines, I, I know I have a leak because I should not have two go routines at that point when I'm quitting my program. I should have only one, which is the main, right? So this, we have the situation where if, if I see total two, that means that my um, this go routine hasn't finished yet while this one finished before this one. And therefore, when I'm hitting this bracket, I have two still running. Uh, and you can sort of see that the first one is proc line 13, which is this, right? That's my first go routine. And then the second, is go line 23, which is this. And you want to see this one. So yeah, uh, uh, th this is like a very cheap, very easy mechanism to make sure that when you're finishing your program, you don't have any hanging uh, go routines around such that you, know, you didn't clean everything properly, right? So I, I hope you understand that. And you also, I hope you understand that if I run it a couple of times, yeah, lucky us, you know, sometimes you're gonna get this hanging one in, sometimes you don't. This time we were lucky, uh, this one finished first, this one went after, and then we only running this line, you know, proc 23, uh, which means we clean, like we don't have any leak of uh, go routines. Does it make sense? Yeah, there is a, a request for a short break. So I will, you know, uh, go to go tour, uh, and you can copy that line from the from the wiki page, and we can have um, yeah uh, five minutes break for people to fetch coffee, if if you need to. So let's uh, I will let you play with this and with the making sure like how would you make sure that this finishes like that this line finishes before we finish this. We could add an extra weight here, right? So what we could do is we could say time sleep. And because what I can have is I can have up to 10 milliseconds race between those two things, right? I, I should not have more than 10 milliseconds uh, delay between either this one finishing first or this one. Uh, so if I wait here for 20 milliseconds, right? So if I say millisecond, then I should always get only one left because that one should always finish before I hit this line. Um, so that's like, yeah, we can test it, but we would need to test it multiple times. Okay, one, 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 okay. What if I reduce it to 10? My hypothesis is that it should also work. One, 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 yeah. Even with five, it probably would work also. Um, but without, it will work sometimes, sometimes not. 50-50, uh, we have 50-50 chance uh, that actually it's not. Yeah, so two, two, two in, two out, four in, two out. Yeah, it's a little bit skewed towards that one finishing first. And the reason for that is that when the execution hits this line, it needs to start the go routines and they, the, the starting happens 
concurrently. So while the starting happens, this one gets a bit of a head start. So this starts potentially slightly faster than this, therefore that has a little bit of an advantage. So from the statistics, we've seen that for six executions, twice this one finished first, but four times this one finished first, right? I, you know, it's very non-scientific, but uh, that's what you would expect. You will have a race with a slight uh, benefit for this one finishing earlier. All right, so let's have a break. Uh, we start back in five minutes. So timer. I will be here so I can answer questions if you have any. And we continue with the, uh, with the channels. So any questions? There is a question. Yeah, so there is a question about sync. So let me do this. Um, the like. Yeah, so there is a, a primitive for synchronization for a um, uh, group of go routines, and that is a good good suggestion. So let's see if there is an example. Yeah, so this one is a good example, but it uses, uh, let me see, examples. Yeah, so here we are using a little bit more heavy machinery with a sync pool, uh, and then we adding, um, we adding what's B. Yeah, so that's not what we want, neither. Yes, let me see. Yeah, so that's that's the one which we want. So that, that's a kind of a sim simple um, mechanism where we can uh, wait for, so we have, we group the, uh, we have kind of a, like a counter uh, which checks uh, how many um, go routines. Uh, so, so we need to keep track of who is still doing something and who finished. And we kind of do it by the by the simple counter. So when we start, uh, when we kind of launch the go routine, we kind of add the uh, add the count. And the moment the go routine finishes, it has the deferred statement, which says, okay, I, I am done, right? So then when the, um, the go routine reports that it is done, it, the, the work group will know, the wait group will know uh, to, to quit the waiting. So we, we sort of, uh, we run some go routines in here uh, for all the URLs. So we have a number of go routines spawned in this loop and then the weight, and every time we kind of adding new one, the weight group knows that there is one more. And then every time one finishes, it notifies the weight group that, okay, one of them was done such that it decreases the, the count. And then once the count gets to zero, then it will quit. So this is, yeah, this is kind of a neat pattern for 
uh, spawning a number of go routines, waiting for all of them to finish, and then kind of uh, quitting that line. So this this line will be blocking if word group is larger than than zero, uh, and then the the, the weight weight group, and then when the weight weight group is hits the, the count zero because uh, it knows that they are kind of done, then it will quit. And then you can be assured that you don't have any hanging uh, tasks in the uh, in memory, right? So yeah, that's a good suggestion uh, from, from someone. I don't know in, um, in the um, Mentimeter, I don't know who asks questions, but yeah, uh, good, good point. This is a, a nice, um, Nice example for uh, coordinating between, the, you know, completely independent uh, go routines. So the the coordination mechanism is done through the kind of a sync weight group. There are multiple ways you can achieve that. So there there are different primitives for coordination and for communicating that certain things are done. Uh, this is one of them. Um, yay, break is over. So. <laughs> Um, another one is to use uh, channels. So we, we will talk. Uh, yeah, so weight group is very similar to semaphores in C++ and that's some of those synchronization mechanisms will be kind of the same. So mutexes, semaphores are basically the same, the same concepts. So if you know them from C++ or, or uh, P threads in C, the, the concepts here are the same. The new concept, however, is the concept of channels. So let's Let's do that uh, slightly differently. So let's um, modify this such that we will not have the, the race uh, such that we will communicate when this guy is done, all right? So one way of communicating when this guy is done is by um, using some sort of a primitive like a mutex or a semaphore such that it will communicate outside that it, con it that it finished, but another mechanism is to use channels. So what is a channel? Um, a channel is kind of like a pipe, and it like remember the last lecture about pipes and I/O. Uh, you put stuff into one end, and you read stuff from the other end. Um, so let's let's uh, try something. So I will say I have a function. Uh, gen number, and that function will generate a number, and it will. So so let's start. Let's start very simple. It it will just generate an int. Okay. Uh, of course, we're gonna return forty two. All right. So then, uh, in my main, I can say that f. Um, I can say four. Uh, I don't care about the index, so I actually don't care about anything. So four make me a um, slice of ints which has um, 10 items and they will be initialized to zero, but I don't care. I just want to run something 10 times. And then I'm um, getting a number. So I, I will not be printing it. Um, you, you know, just get an idea that I'm getting a number here. So I'm getting a number. Uh, so I'm calling this function and it returns me a number. Um, and that's great. Uh, I can make an assignment here. I can say G equals that number. But what if I, this, let's say this, takes a long time and I want to run it. Uh, I want to do some other things while this generates this number and I want to do it in the go routine, right? So I cannot really do this because if I do this, I cannot, you know, I, I lost the, the, the um, I lost the communication with where the, the return type comes back. So I can return a number in a normal way if I'm doing it in the same thread or go routine. So main is, is in itself a, a go routine. But if I'm running go num in a separate go routine, this pattern sort of doesn't, 
work anymore. I, I can't kind of do this, right? So the uh, multiple mechanisms to, to achieve this. One mechanism is that I have some sort of callbacks. So in, if you come from Node.js or some other callback based kind of um, languages, what would you do is you would kind of uh, put a Lambda here, uh, which says, okay, generate, yeah, you, you would not have this. You would say, generate me a number. And then when you generate this number, uh, so I could say var g as an int, and then I would say g equals, you know, uh, what the, like usually the callback gets either the parameters of what gennum generated. Uh, so I would probably have the, the number n, which is an int, which gennum will pass to the callback. And then I would say this, right? And by doing that, at that point here, I know that I have g bound to the, the new number. But it is kind of ugly. Like, first of all, uh, the callbacks, yes, I mean, it's a legitimate mechanism. We use them for interrupts and we kind of use them uh, for a lot of things. But having this kind of a global state here, um, it's a little bit cumbersome. And also I need to have, here I have to have a mechanism to wait, right? Uh, so I need to use some sort of a mechanism for waiting here, because if I need to do something with G, I don't know if G has is ready or not. So usually uh, you have a, a mechanism of future and promises with the callback based mechanisms, such that I can say get value. Uh, and then this method will block if I don't have G, but G will be kind of a promise, like a future future of int, something like this, right? Uh, so in some programming languages, you have kind of futures and promises, you have callbacks, and then you kind of wire that up this way, um, not in Golang. So in Golang, what, <laughs> what you do is you say, okay, I need a number and it will happen at some time in the future, but I don't know when. So instead of returning a number, this function will take a channel, which is this concept of the pipe. So when the number is ready, it will put the number into the pipe, right? So channels are, are kind of a called chan in, in Golang. And uh, I need a variable. So let's say I have a result is my uh, channel variable. And then they are typed. So there is a very kind of a strict typing of what can go into the channel. And in our case, it's an integer, right? Uh, it could be a string, could be a struct, could be an interface, could be another channel. You can put any type in here uh, as a type of a channel. Um, and then this enforces uh, and checks if you're putting stuff into the channel of a proper type, right? So then this function doesn't return anything. It takes long time. And after this long time, what it will do, it will uh, say result gets 42. So this is a channel operator, which is used for either putting stuff into the channel or reading stuff out of the channel. Uh, if you want to put stuff in, the arrow points to the channel. If you want to read stuff out, so let's say I want to read a number G from the channel, I would say um, result, and then I would put the channel operator pointing out of the channel, right? So you see here, I'm reading out of the channel and assigning it to G. If I'm writing into the channel, um, I'm doing arrow into the channel. So the arrow direction is always left, but the argument is either on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side. So then I can either read or write from the channel. Simple. Um, so <laughs> because channels can be, channels can have inflow and outflow. And in my method here, I said, I passed the channel and then I didn't specify which direction the, um, the communication goes. So this method can both read from the channel and write into the channel. But in my case, I want gen number to ever read from the channel because that would be kind of illegal. I don't want gen num to ever do something like this. Then I can restrict 
And uh, what I can say is I can say that uh, you can only write to the channel. Um, and that would mean that this method cannot read. So if this method tries to do something like this, um, so if this method tries to read from the channel, uh, let me see if I have any other bugs here. Um, yeah, let's delete that. Yeah, let's delete everything for now. Um, actually, the prof can stay. Let's delete everything such that I don't have any other issues. All right, so let's try to compile it. So it says, look, uh, in line 14, you're trying to read from the channel. You're trying to do invalid operation, reading from a channel, but the channel is sent only, right? So I can restrict what this channel is. If I do this, the compiler will be happy. It says, yeah, it's, um, it's fine. It, it kind of does nothing like, uh, yeah, let's comment that out also. So our main does nothing and it's all good. Uh, yes, okay, I have a lot of not used uh, things. Yeah, let's keep that in. Right, um, so let's, let's restrict. So it's only sent only. I can, I can make channels that are only read only, that this guy cannot send stuff in. So now it will complain about line 12. So if I do this, Fair enough, it complains about like line 12. Like you cannot write to this channel. It's a um, receive only channel, right? All right, so great. So we have a concept of a channel and we have a concept of read only or send only channels and we are sending this number here. So now how are we gonna get it? Well, uh, that's, you know, pretty simple. I will go again number. And now I need to pass a kind of a, a, a channel or some, some variable to it. So it's the same as with everything, with most things in Go, you, you make a channel. So you make a channel, uh, so you say, I want to make a channel of ints. And then you pass it here, and then you will say, I want to read from C. So I want to get this number. So my number is, I'm reading from C. And this line will block. So if there, if there is nothing in the C yet, this line will block and wait for something to be able to be read and then it will assign it to num and then we can print it. So I can print it. Um, great, so let's run it. And voila, it prints 42. You know, our, our thing worked. So we make, made the channel, we pass the channel to our concurrently executed gen num. Uh, I can put a delay here or whatever, so it can take some time. And then this call will wait until this one is done and returns the result and read from it and we done. So what if I don't make this, but I say C is a channel of int. So now I have a null channel. I haven't make it yet. I have just declared a variable and I try to, uh, to run it. So if I did that in the IDE in uh, IntelliJ, IntelliJ at that point would complain that I haven't initialized C yet, uh, that C is a null channel. Um, and the null channels uh, kind of a construct that is a little bit tricky because the, this will block forever. This will never get anything because this will never write to a um, um, null neither. So the, the null channel is like a special case where whatever you write to it disappears and whatever you try to read from it will never happen. Okay, so, and it basically uh, uh, not null nil. Um, so what it basically happened here is that I am blocking here for reading and it says um, that, that I have a pro pro problem because um, I will never fulfill this. 
So remember that if you want to use a channel, it has to be initialized. And to initialize the channel, you have to make it. So you either do it with this dot notation, or if you, know, if you want to have var somewhere else, and then you want to initialize it, you move this line here, um, channel int. When you're making a channel, you, it's always bidirectional, right? So C is, is bidirectional, but then you can restrict it what, how you pass around when you're passing kind of a single directional channels. But when you're making it, of course, you have to be able to read and write from it because you need to have both ends. So now it will work. And um, just to make sure that it works, yes, it works. We have 42, no errors, single thread at deadline here. Great, so let's go back to our problem of coordination. So if I want to say this, but I want to say it such that it will tell me when it finished, then I need to have this kind of concept of a channel. So again, I will have done, which is um, make, let's make a channel of bool, right? So if I get true, I know you're done. And at that point here, so I will pass, um, I will pass done. And I will pass done. And then I'm not gonna sleep here. And in here I will read. So I am gonna read, oops, from done. And this is my first reading from done, uh, from this say. And then I'm doing, I'm gonna read the second done from my second go routine, which is when this one finishes, it will also put done in. And I don't know if the first done is gonna come from here or the first done is gonna come from here. I don't care about the order. I just care that I get two of them finished. And then when two of them finished, I know in this at this point, I don't have any hanging threads around. So in here, I will, uh, instead of, yeah, that's fine. Uh, we are not actually using it. Uh, so here I have, done, which is a channel, which is a channel of bool, and it's um, append only, so uh, send only, and then when this function is finished, it will write to done, true, I'm done. And then our logic will work, and we have a coordination without the sync. Um, let me check what uh, let me delete that so we don't have extra things. We have a channel down here. I'm reading from down. Yeah, that should work. Let me try again. So I have some problems. Uh, we need to debug. So we have a problem in line 15. So Done is a channel of bool. Yeah, that's fine. Ah, yes. Okay. So, um, when you, um, No, that should work. That should still work. You don't need buffer channels. So there is an additional concept because normally the channel has enough slots only for one uh, value. So if you want to allow uh, multiple people to write to channels, then you can say that the channel has a capacity to store uh, multiple values. Maybe, maybe that is... Uh, our problem. Yeah, that was our problem. So what was our problem that um, we, okay, so, okay. So if, if, if I have only one slot, what can happen is um, this guy starts and is, is, is doing things. And then this guy um, starts and is doing things. And then I have, Two, two reds, uh, but I can only write one thing at a time. So it 
could have happened that I have a, a race condition between uh, one of the go routines writing and this one reading. So because you see, if, if I have if I have them independent, like three independent threads, and in one thread I'm only waiting to read the re reports, and those are independent, then I will not have the kind of the uh, race condition. But if one of them is the same one which blocks here and reads, then I have a problem because um, I might have finished this one earlier than this one tries to read, and then I'm, I'm getting into a deadlock. Uh, so if, if I do this, with a single slot, it will always work. But if you see, it's fine. But if I if I have this, I have to have this ability of this of this uh, race condition such that I have to increase the channel capacity to two, such that both of them, the one here and the one here, can always write to the to the channel because there are two slots. So I don't care about the order, uh, but I can always write twice, and then I can always read twice. This is not necessary if both of them run in the same um, uh, in independent Go routines, and this happens in the independent Go routine as well, right? So now um, it's fine. If you have this, you may happen to have a race condition, in which case you have to increase the the buffer of the channel to two, at least two. All right. I hope that kind of explains the channels and the. <laughs> the Go routines. Uh, you can go through this tutorial and you can watch the other talks. Um, I have four minutes left because we had um, a break, which it eaten up uh, five minutes. So what I will do is I will jump to the, to the final thing. Uh, and the final thing here is, yep, yep, yep. All right. So, Go testing framework. Go testing framework is very simple. It has unit tests, it has examples, and it has ben benchmarks. So what we're gonna do is I uh, I will show you the I will show you the uh, IntelliJ. I will show you the example of um, unit tests and um, examples very quickly. So in the Git repo of the course, there is a, um, there is a arithmetic calc arithmetic uh, file, which defines adder. So it's a, a very trivial uh, thing that we add to numbers, and now we need to write test for it. So we typically, uh, it's not convention, it actually is enforced. You, you should have the same file name and underscore test for testing the functions that you have in that. It, it is convention, but it is very useful convention because the testing framework uses that convention. Um, so then if I open this one, you will see I have a test case uh, which says testing add function, and then I'm adding two numbers and I'm checking if the uh, response is what I expect. And if it isn't, I have this parameter here uh, where uh, I'm printing a, an error. Um, I can I can delete this and I can rewrite it. If you're using an IDE and you start typing, if you say func test, it will uh, suggest from that module what files do you want to test. So I say test add and it will add this type for you automatically. And then you you write your test uh, testing. So if I do add one and two. Uh, testing like this, I know I expect three. It's a little bit um, tedious uh, because I, I know what I want to test and I, I need to iterate over some things such that usually what you want to do is you want to do something like um, declare, um, you want to declare an array of some sort where you have the test input and test output and then you can uh, you can get uh, the um, so if I go back here so instead of doing this like one by one uh, it's better to do it in a loop right and then there is a second concept called examples an example is that you basically print something to the screen 
write a comment saying slash slash outputs a colon, and then you write here what you expect to have in the output. And this will be checked, checked for you by the testing framework. Uh, and then if you go to edit configurations in your uh, IntelliJ and you say add go test and you click through this. And then if you run the tests, what's gonna happen is Golang gonna run all those test functions. Uh, I have just one and all those example functions and check if the output of calling those functions is the one which you specified here. And if it is, everything will be fine. So if I run my tests here, you will see that I have example at example sum, example sum for, and so on, and test at all run and all completing correctly. Uh, if I, for example, say print at one and two, and I say I I should get five, and I rerun it, it will say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. Uh, one of the examples, one of the examples, you know, I got. Uh, 30 and three, so 30 for this, three for this, but you expect it to get five, right? So it kind of tells you what you got and what you expected and that it's wrong. So that's a kind of a neat way of doing tests. Um, yeah, so Jon, Jon Gunnar suggests writing those example functions and the tests before you actually write your functions, because then you can you know, automatically verify that your functions are correct. And that's what I did actually. So that's what I did yesterday. Uh, I was writing the sum and sum for, which is the sum over the, um, the slices. And I actually had a bug because if you look here, I had to do this notation for splitting the, the big slice into four smaller slices. And I had a bug because this, the, the first index is inclusive, the second index is exclusive. So my, my function was originally like this, um, and I thought it's gonna work, but because the second index is exclusive, I have to pl do plus one here. So I wrote the test, I wrote my function, the test failed, and I discovered the bug, right? Uh, it, it, it is useful. So I will commit uh, this extensions with tests and with the parallel and um, uh, sequential sum. So you see here I'm summing the uh, the numbers in a single loop, or here I'm splitting into four go routines and I'm summing it up like this. And you can compare the, the timing. So in the main function, I am measuring how long it's gonna take to do the parallel sum or sequential sum, and you can you can test it. Um, you can play with it if you want. And here you can control how many processes, how many operating system processes you want to run it on. Uh, so you either do it here by uh, using this using this function or when you run it, so if I quit, uh, if I quit it um, and I show you how I ran it last night. So you can specify this constant uh, in your command line to force the, the particular executable to use that many processes. Uh, so you can run it on a single uh, single core version, so single process and measure the, measure the performance, or you can run it with uh, multiple, uh, multiple ones. I don't have, um, I didn't build it uh, with the latest thing, so it doesn't print anything, uh, but you get the idea. All right, so again, we run a little bit of time, but testing is basically self-explanatory through the code. Uh, you, you write those tests either as an examples or as actual tests, and it is useful to write them before you write the implementations. Um, and then with the Go routines and Go channels, you do need to get a little bit into it such that I uh, encourage you to check the, the additional videos that I posted and some of the uh, code that is uh, available in the, uh, in the project. Uh, you don't have to finish Haskell two tasks this week. Uh, I will post the deadlines for the, for the Haskell tasks 
uh, probably over the weekend, but you will have at least an extra week for that. So uh, don't expect the deadline to be this or next week. It might be next week weekend. So you have uh, uh, roughly two weeks for that. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow. And tomorrow we will discuss the um, HDP server and JSON, uh, JSON parsing. Can we make unbounded channels? Uh, so the, the channels are not bound. So you can put as, as much stuff to it, right? So if I, uh, if I have this code, where is it? Here. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and I have a channel done, um, multiple people can, can write to it. So if I have it in a loop and there is a thousand of those says trying to run to the same channel, that's fine. As long as I kind of uh, have read it all. So the, um, the moment that you try to write to a channel and the channel is full, you will block. And then once somebody reads from it, the slot will become empty and then you can write to it. So that's what the buffer is for. It's, uh, so the size here dictates how much buffer do you have in a channel, but if the buffer size is one, which is the default, you can still write to it indefinitely, right? So they are kind of not bound by, um, by like the channel buffer is bound, but the ability to, for threads to write to it is unbound. Uh, such that if you try to write to a full channel, it will block, wait for the channel to get a slot empty, and then it will uh, continue, right? So if I have, so what, what, if, what it effectively means here is that if I have those two go routines and one of them uh, wrote to, uh, so one of them wrote to the output, but this one didn't write yet. And then the, this one will block, uh, because the slot is occupied. And that's why we got the deadlock. Uh, so if I increase it to two, then I, I have it like this. So if, if you want a channel with unbound buffer capacity, the answer is you can't. The buffer capacity is always bound, but the ability to write to a channel is always unrestricted. So even with the capacity one, uh, you can have uh, you can, you know, you can have a loop here. I, I can uh, write, uh, I can write code, which would do this in a loop uh, on that single value channel. It's just that the, sec the, the moment the channel is full, this hole will block and wait until that, you know, some, some reading happened such that I can write to it. If I have um, if I know that this is happening up to five or whatever, and I, I say my channel buffer is 100 or, or 20, then th those will be non-blocking calls because I have all the values stored in a buffer, but otherwise they will become blocking. Does it explain it? So any, any, other, any other questions? So the default channel buffer size is one. You can increase it, uh, but the ability to write, yeah, it's it's sort of like a pipe that you read from and write to, and it is not really restricted. But it will make a difference whether the calls are blocking or non-blocking. Yeah, there is one extra concept that I didn't go through today. Uh, maybe I just mention it tomorrow, which is select. Uh, it's a kind of a useful concept for uh, checking what channels have something to read from and then it continues. It's sort of like a switch statement, uh, but it is explained in the, in the Go tool quite well. All right, so if there are no, uh, no questions, then I, again, I encourage you to check the videos. They might be a little bit uh, advanced such that you do need to read the code a little bit. Uh, and, and stop sometimes, but they, they are quite good and they introduce a number of useful patterns for concurrency um, in, the, in, in the Golang uh, language. And then I will see you guys uh, tomorrow. So thank you very much.